on the first Oh, thank you. Uh, on the first one, um, I actually, although I've done all those things that he talked about and ended up working for at the University of Maryland uh, with you, where I was a professor and a dean, and then I ended up working for Marriott running their executive program. But in my consulting practice, I also, my goodness, I, I did significant work for Lockheed Martin for years and, uh, and a bunch of other wonderful companies. But what I'm doing now is just, I've got to say, got it. So I don't have to look at, oh, no, I don't want to leave meeting. Oh, okay. Well, never mind. Do you know how to say got it? <laughs> yes. Oh. oh, oh, okay. I use a mouse. See, I'm not the old fashioned girl. Um, in any case, so, but I'm pretty much retired. And what I've done with this portion of my life is dedicated almost totally to issues that affect women. And the reason I'm doing that is that I have some opportunities to, I think, make a difference. And uh, except for the 13 and my church activities, I'm a president of AEW for my branch and was state president. And I'm um, very, very active in the uh, Maryland uh, Commission on Status, or excuse me, the Maryland Historical Commission for Women. And so we, I'm, I'm active in a number of groups. But anyway, so for me personally, my husband says, well, you work as hard as you ever did, you just aren't making any money. And, uh, and that's actually true. I work as hard as I ever did. I'm not making any money, but I am getting a great deal of satisfaction. But so a couple of years ago, I as active as I am in AEW and remain that way, I talked to one of my friends and I said, you know, I love AEW because we are, we do things that really matter to women. We worry about women's job opportunities, about payment, about equitable treatment, about sexual harassment, all of these issues that are very important. But then I realized that um, I had some concerns about women elsewhere in the world, and that was not what AEW is going to focus on. <laughs> uh, and when I started looking at this, it became even more upsetting to me because these were pretty urgent issues. Child marriage, uh, no ability to get education in some countries, all of these really bad things. So I spoke to a friend of mine and she said, well, Pat, I think what you wanna do is join Graduate Women International. So literally while I was sitting with her, I joined Graduate Women International because that all came out. <clears throat> And that is what led me to the direction that I have taken in part of my life since then. And that is to, um, to focus on some of these issues facing our, our women sisters throughout the world. Uh, many good stories, but I have to tell you, as all of you, I think probably know from reading the news, a lot of very troubling things that in many ways, I think we feel we're going backward uh, internationally with some women's issues. And I find that troubling myself and am working on it. So, so that's how my interest came. Okay, now the next piece of this is the, um, oh, oh, I should say that Washington, uh, Women Graduates International has a US affiliate, which is Women Graduates USA. It's kind of like, I don't know, where you have a big, you know, the, the national organization and then little pieces. Well, this is international and then this. this. And I'm very active in that group. Um, I am secretary of the board and very involved, and it's it's a wonderful group. Okay, so the WGI, Women Graduates International, has a long-time relationship with the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. Um, the commission actually started back in 1946 when I think after World War II, we were optimistic about uh, you know rebuilding and about equality and some issues that uh, so got us involved in this. And so the Commission on the Status of Women was started by the UN in 1946. And um, it fluttered along and did some important things. I see people on the screen who probably can remember some of those early, early years as well as I, as I do. Um, but then a, ma a big change occurred in 1995. And that's when the Beijing meeting was, it's called the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. That was the outcome of this one meeting. This actually wasn't one of the yearly meetings. The Commission on the Status of Women meets yearly at the UN um, as we did this, this spring for the first time for I think three or four years, three years, I guess. Um, this was one of four separate meetings and it actually took place in Beijing, hence the name. Um, and Hillary Clinton, who was at that point, um, the first lady of the United States was a speaker and involved. And 
that was a big turning point because at that point, the agenda got greatly expanded. So all of a sudden the UN took this on and actually the following year in 96 said that the status of women was now going to be raised in priority to the highest level at the UN. So that was a big deal. It was also a big deal because it was the first time that um, we'd really said as in internationally that women ought to have choices about their own, their own health, their own birth control issues, these other things. We made a statement and the Beijing group made a statement that this should be true for when women throughout the world should have these opportunities. So that, um, uh, that anyway, so that, that made sense to, to many people, but it also greatly expanded the agenda. So ever since 1995, there was sort of like a reset. And now every single year we take the overall theme, which is equality for women and girls, but do we add a specific thing to it each year that we also focus on for the meetings? And this most recent year, it was on the um, data collection and data work and data harassment. So it was all things about data and how it affects women, women's job opportunities, but also women's lives in other ways. And um, uh, the year before, even though that we did not meet in New York, we did have a virtual meeting, which I participated in. I will tell you, though, sitting all day in your little chair in your office watching a screen like this is too many hours in front of the screen for me. However, what we did that year was we talked about climate change and the particular effects on women. And um, and next year, the theme is uh, next year, the theme is going to be on finance and financing opportunities for women. In each of these areas, the perspective of the Commission on the Status of Women is to look at how that issue impacts women's ability to uh, make a living, to run their family, to where they live. Um, and so we, it's, it's very focused. And the way we learn together is through a series of presentations. Unlike other UN commissions, and I'm looking at people I think probably know more about this than I do, um, this one allows full participation by NGOs and other concerned organizations. So this is different from other UN commissions. For example, Taiwan is not allowed to participate in, uh, in normal UN activities because they aren't a member state because of the, as you well, are well aware, the continuing uh, conflict about its status. However, they can participate here as individuals and as organizations within Taiwan. So that's one of the advantages as we get this broader kind of uh, perspective. The other thing we, and, and each, each conference then starts with a, we look at what we did last time and say, we passed a bunch of resolutions last time, which we do as a commission on the status of women. Actually, we do way down here and then we start pushing them up and then they, pick or choose what they're going to do. And then those go to the top level of the UN. And if they become policy, then it becomes policy for the member states. And they call them states, I guess, you know, anyway, of the UN. Um, but what we do at the beginning then of each meeting is go and say, what did we, how well did we do last time? What have we done since we said this last year? And then we end each meeting with, here's what we are going to be doing. Now that doesn't usually come out right away afterwards because we have to get all the wording right and everything, but we have issues on which we pass resolutions. And the good news about that is the people that take these resolutions seriously, take them really seriously and do things about them. But I don't have to tell you that the Taliban is probably not listening to our resolutions with, uh, with eager ears saying, what can we do to get involved? Uh, they, are, they have no legal, nor would they say moral, responsibility to listen to what the UN Commission on the Status of Women says. So as concerned as we are, and I will tell you some of the things I learned about this, but as concerned as we are, for example, in Iran and Afghanistan about denying women educational opportunities, we can urge, we can push, we can cajole, we can do anything, but we don't have any legal authority to say you can't do that. I wish we did because it's just, it's, it's, it's sort of wrong that we can't, but we can't. So um, we do have abilities to provide pressure and we do that. 
But in any case, so each area, so anyway, the point of this is that each meeting starts with a, going back to the last one, it's always kicked up by somebody important. Last year it was uh, Kamala Harris, but it's always some major person who kicks off the meeting. And then we do some large sessions, but most of the work is done in very small sessions and people apply to do those sessions. They may be governments or they may be NGOs or they may be a group of interested people and you apply to do this. So you have to get your, your uh, session approved. But for example, in my organization, we have probably a half a dozen people who actually made presentations this year or were parts of panels. Uh, on, and one particular one was on medical care, for example, and the status of women. And we know that both in the US and outside the US, that's a big issue. So, so anyway, we have all of these concurrent sessions. It's get very complicated because you go, you pick and choose what you want to go to. And I tend to, well, I will just talk about the particular, some of them I chose that might be of interest to you. Um, uh, the people who get to present again are sort of experts, but not necessarily official. But one of the meetings I went to was uh, for Afghanistan. And there was a, uh, all of the people on the panel were from Afghanistan. Uh, one of the women was here studying violin. She was a graduate student. She actually said that she was a conductor of the only women's orchestra in Af Afghanistan. I don't believe that would be allowed right now, but it was, so that's her background. But she was talking to me, uh, to, not to me, to all of us. And she was saying, we know just recently two of her friends had been killed for wanting to go to school. And then she said, my younger sister at home, she's back in Afghanistan, she had four of her friends were just murdered for wanting to get an education. So this is not small stakes we're talking about. We're talking about people for not being able to get an education and that they have little recourse. Uh, their protests are met without legal. It isn't that they're arrested or something. It's just they're summarily dismissed and, and in many cases murdered. Um, so some of these are pretty, pretty depressing, and yet they're important. I went to one on Armenia. Some of you may know that my daughter served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Armenia for two years. And so I went to their presentation, and theirs was much more optimistic. They had invested money and, re and other resources into expanding the job opportunities for women in this sector, in the data sector. So it would be a uh, STEM issues like uh, it might be computers, but it's something about data use. And they had increased in one year since uh, they had done this little experiment. 20% of the people in that field were, were women before. In one year, 30% were. So what they're doing is they're making, are you okay? Oops. Oh, signed out. Oh, are we on? I see people still. Yeah, okay, I see people still. Well, Somebody whatever. So, oh, that's it. Okay, that's fine. Um, so anyway, oh, oh, we're frozen. Oh, can you not see this? It all looks okay to me. Okay, okay. Um, in any well, case, so so that was a good story. And it happened this year that the president of the group happened to be from Armenia. So that was also interesting. I went to one large session uh, on Ukraine. And that was particularly interesting because there were each seven or eight women at the front on this panel. Every one of those women was an official, had a very high level official in Ukraine, which told me something about the country. That is, women are a big share of the leadership in Ukraine. And they were dealing with the specific problems of women in this environment of constant um, fear, constant attack, and still trying to to focus on women's needs and concerns at this time and how difficult that is. But it was quite, that was also quite inspirational. Although again, you know, people aren't necessarily listening to what the UN has to say about, about all of this. But as interesting as the sessions were, and I went to some others I can talk about, what was much more interesting and the reason having this in person is so much better in my opinion, than uh, doing this online is that it's all the off time stuff that's the interesting stuff. I think I had a dinner every evening with some group or other. Uh, Women Graduates International, which is I mean, when I'm on these calls, there are people from you know Australia and Switz Switzerland where the headquarters is, and I mean they're all over the world. But I hadn't met these people before, 
and we had this wonderful dinner and it was you know those are those are the things and i met some people who are uh, i had never heard their names before but within this community they're famous because there's one woman who uh, was in Uganda for seven years during just terrible times and had become a hero because she put her life on the line. And there are all these amazing people. It's kind of like the little old lady in tennis shoes kind of story. Well, there are a lot of little old ladies in tennis shoes running around doing these jobs. And it's it's very, very impressive. But so anyway, I had a chance to do that. I had interactions with my uh, graduate women international group from the U.S. But there were other groups. I went to just some meetings. There was one cruise, it's just called Women USA, but I said, what the heck, I'll go. And I did, that was interesting. That's headed by a, um, a woman. <laughs> Actually, her name is Susan Lee, which gets confusing to me only because I have a good friend named Susan Lee here, who's the Secretary of State right now. And this is Susan Lee, who's the, uh, she's a reverend and a PhD and head of this group. So I keep getting my emails confused, but nonetheless, um, these are the kinds of groups that you meet and then I just had private lunches, for example, um, um, I had a lunch with Gloria Blackwell, who is the president of uh, AEW for, I mean, for the whole organization, and she is their representative to the UN. But we had a lunch, too. So you get a chance to talk to people in settings that are much less formal and, to be honest, probably more honest in the sense of, or candid might be the word than, rather than honest, if the others aren't dishonest this is more candid. I was lucky enough, for those of you who know the UN, to stay right across the street at the Millennium Hotel. Um, and the nice thing about that is a huge number of people stay there. And the lobby is like a little minor UN itself. And you can just walk up to these people and talk to them, which I did. I'm not exactly shy. So I just walked up to people and said, where are you from? And, and it, was, it led to some very interesting uh, uh, conversations and information. So so all of these, all of these things pull together. You really feel like you're part of something in the world that's important. And these women are passionate about these issues. And I have become passionate about these issues. Some of them I can do something about, and those are the positive things. Some I can't. One personal observation, this is nothing official, but I'm just going to say it now because it seemed to be pretty obvious to me. In my, this is only my personal observation, but my personal observation is we don't really care much in this country about the UN, with the exception, I think, of the Security Council. But I fear that the rest of the UN, um, there are people in this country who actually actively oppose the UN, but even those people who don't actively oppose aren't necessarily the champions. And I would say that what I observed in the other countries, and I talked to, I mean, I was at the, I'll tell you about, I was at the Mex Mexican consulate, for example. I mean, these people are intense about their passion for the UN and their hope that the UN can resolve uh, a number of sticky issues. Um, but the UN, I mean, I mean, even the UN ambassador didn't reach out to, to uh, the, from the U.S. didn't reach out to us, and we apparently tried to reach out. So my point is, it's just not as high a priority as I would think it should be, and as I would hope it would be, and as it is for many, many countries. Um, and one of my goals also is to is to try to get that, um, uh, you know, sort of get, get people to understand more what the U.N. is or could be. And because the UN is still there. When you hear about things in Somalia now and stuff, I mean, the UN is right in there talking about what the need is and getting that information. And but, but we do not seem as a country to take it as seriously as as I wish. And I remember UNICEF, for example, as a youngster, I, I was very involved in my. I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota, but Fargo Moorhead was like a community. And I ran a thing every year for instead when we're on Halloween, we went out, we collected money for UNICEF. And that was a really big deal um, because UNICEF we saw as, you know, helping children, even we were older children, but we were children. And, um, and those are the kinds of ways we learned about US, UN roles that I just don't see that now, but that's a very personal thing. Nobody said this at our meeting. I'm just saying it. Um, however, getting back to the, getting back to this, um, a number of other activities take place, and one of them is what we call CAMIAS. 
And Camillus is a, a document uh, that we signed, and that would be Women Graduates USA, with our counterparts from Canada and our counterparts from Mexico. Canada, CA, Mexico, ME, US, US, Camillus. And we signed a document to cooperate on issues including education and including um, economic issues um, and immigration issues. So we're looking at these three countries and how we can work together. And I was invited to, a, I suppose there were 20 of us maybe in the room to the signing of the document, but we did have the ambassador actually uh, from Mexico there. And um, too many people gave speeches because it was one of those things where, you know, you have to, the press release has to say, yes, so-and-so spoke and they said this, well, that's fine. But it was quite inspiring to me because there's a real commitment to work across our borders this way. And interestingly enough, they picked the monarch butterfly and I actually had one and I thought I brought it this morning, but we got each got a little monarch butterfly. But the reason that's a symbol is that monarch butterflies fly back and forth. You know what I'm going to say, from Canada to the U.S. to Mexico to the U.S. to so, so the monarch is sort of a symbol of what we're doing, cooperating among these, these groups. But that was quite, quite an impressive um, thing to be a part of. So my point of all this is being in person is a lot better than participating virtually, but virtually, participating virtually still is educational, but it's, it's not, um, not as, as big a deal, I guess. I mean, it, or you can't fully participate, even in asking questions and things, it's very hard to do that. So um, I, I have a, a few things that about this year's meeting, because we, um, we wanted to talk about this digital technology pro program and this lended its, lent itself to a number of different issues that face, well, one is getting jobs in this sector. One is getting access to technology at all, you know, getting access to the internet, getting access to the equipment, the computers, the whatever we need. Um, but the other side of it is the use of it. And the harassment issues, you certainly are aware in this country of so much um, um, harassment via the internet, via whether it's TikTok or whether it's person, but, there's a lot of harassment. Unfortunately, women far more than men, not exclusively, but far more men are subject to that kind of harassment. So, um, so we also dealt with that side of it is the point. So you take these issues and forever you can eat away at them, but many of the presentations are more on general equity issues. And they, for example, there were some on medicine, some on other issues. So they don't, they don't exclude you from doing that. And people have those particular interests. And there's some people who attend this who are, uh, you know, they have one big issue that they really care about. Now, in our group, for example, we took money last year and, uh, and we took one community in Africa that had no prenatal care for, or, or postnatal uh, care for, for women having babies. So you had a baby, you came in and you had your baby and that was it. Well, the, as you might guess, the mortality rates were very high, both for mothers and for children, and the complications were very high. Well, what we did was we funded medical care for, we call it the fourth trimester too, the, the trimesters of the, the trimesters of the pregnancy. And then we call the fourth trimester, the first, you know, the first three months of life. So, and we were able to pay for medical care for this community, for the children and the mothers. Now we do this as sort of a pilot project, but as you might guess, the results were amazing because the statistics, I mean, it wasn't a small jump, it was a jump of you know, 50%, I mean, it was a big, big jump. And, but why do we do this? We do this for two reasons. One is first a demonstration. One of the things that the UN Commission on the Status of Women does is gather data about all kinds of things because that can convince people that maybe it's in their economic best interests or their uh, dem democratic best interests or something to, to include women. But anyway, so we're collecting data. So part of it's that, part of it's that communities nearby see the see what can happen with, um, in this particular case, it was medical care, but it could have been talked about other stuff. And that's, um, and so that's one way you start getting change in small increments. 
obviously we're all looking for bigger change in that, you know, little increments take a long time, but it's one way. And a lot of these projects are highlighted in the UN meeting. So people will talk about taking on a project in um, Mexico or in, uh, you know, France or wherever on one of these issues and the successes or failures that they had, but how they dealt with it. So what you get is we're sort of teaching each other. And now I get a vote. I don't get to vote on the final things that the commission approves, but I get to vote down here where we put, we, we set our priorities and we put them into, and people are very expert on doing this, the right kind of form, the right kind of language for the UN. So I'm, I'm involved on here in our group, Graduate Women International, always has a number of, of um, issues that we care about that we're pushing for. And what we try to do then is find allies at other organizations so that we get a bigger group of people pushing for things that we care about. Um, and so we've learned, and many people have participated for years. Somebody said, do you get to participate again? And the funny thing about this is they really make it hard to get picked the first time. You have to fill out all this stuff of why you should do this. Once you're in, it's like you're grandfathered in, you know, they forget you. So I will be able to go again, which I plan to in, in March. And I will tell you last year I went, I said, I just want to do this once just to see what it's like, because you know, it's kind of interesting. And it was, I mean, it was, it far exceeded my expectations. So I'm going to go as long as they let me go. Um, the way it's paid for, if you're interested, is um, the UN pays for, now we really pretty much take over that main, you know, the, this part of the UN that's not this part? Well, this part, we pretty much take over that part and all those rooms and finding the rooms is, if any of you, if some of you know the UN, but for me, finding the rooms was one of the big challenges. Luckily, they had a lot of people to help us um, because you'd go, well, where's 1A? Well, now is that 1A here or 1A there? And I'm going, here's what it says, 1A. <laughs> so they would find it. But, but um, so anyway, they do all this and it's a big project because they turn over this and they do a lot of work. But, and you don't pay for that. You don't pay a registration or anything. That is covered by the UN. However, you do pay your own expenses. So for me, it was just coming up from Washington. So it was my vamoose bus and then my staying in a hotel. And, uh, but if you're from California or, or obviously people all over the world are coming, it can be an expensive thing. Now, some are sponsored and that's obviously would be nice. Many are. Um, in our case, our organization does not do that. And we... Uh, but it was still, you know, I had hotel bills and I, yeah, some food. I mean, no, no, not a big deal. But it is something that the reason I bring it up, I think that makes it prohibitive to some people to participate. Some of the very people who are probably among the underserved. So one of the challenges is to do that. Now, we do provide stipends for some people, but they're usually very young people who actually have not yet established their career, are people who are in some kind of disadvantaged. Right now, we, for example, have a, what is it called? It's a scholars program, but it's for people who can't practice their field in their own country. And so we take them in and we give them a stipend to be in the US. What's it called? Some kind of scholars. Anyway, not protected. Anyway, the point only on this is we would pay for them, for example, with their, we would pay for their airfare and their stay for them to attend. But for most of us, that's not the case. And it does, it's one of the other weaknesses, I think, is that we don't have uh, ways for to subsidize enough people. In other countries, I will say, I think many times the, the countries or the organizations are large enough to pay for these people, but we, we don't have that, um, um, we don't have that kind of uh, resources here. So that's, that's not what we do. Um, Anyway, I wanted to tell you a little bit about this digital technology. For example, um, um, women are 27 times more likely to be harassed online than men are. So I said the number was big. That's what we were told. So, and, uh, and so we have to, it can be a wonderful force. Technology can be a great force. And especially for issues like sharing information, especially if we can sneak it out of country so we know but if bad things are happening, that there's a way to find out. But on the other hand, it can be used for bad. So one of the issues that we face here is how do we harness social media 
so that it's part of the solution and not part of the problem. So, so that's kind of where, where we were there. I want to go back. There's a few, I have several things I wanted to go into in more depth. That's kind of an overview. Um, maybe before I do that, because I want to go into some of the things that we learned this year, but maybe before I do that, I know I have people who either have direct or indirect experience, uh, because what I want to do then is go over how we set the agenda, but I wanted to, to um, see if anyone has comments or concerns before I move on to that. Let, okay. let me yeah. um, sure, Steve. exercise Chair's prerogative here a little bit and, and talk about how different this is from the typical UN conference. Yes, that's, a, that's why it's important. That's true. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have represented the U.S. at a major conference on the status of antitrust law of the world. Yeah. Completely different structure. It was governments only. Mm -hmm. The gov world governments were organized into about four groups, and yeah. the groups spoke as a unified yeah. group. We had the Western democracies, yeah. which was mm -hmm. essentially the OECD U.S., European, yeah. Australia. Um, we had the G77, which is the developing countries. Mm -hmm. And then China was a group by itself. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. The U.S. role in that was, was twofold. Number one, we wanted to protect <clears throat> the antitrust and, and monopolistic position of patent holders in the pharmaceutical area. Oh, okay. Because... That's what drives up drug prices, and much of the developing world wants and needs to get yes, right. much better access to new drugs. Right. Our second goal was to make sure that the United Nations did not spend a dime more. The U.S., in that sense, really doesn't like the U.N. Yeah. There is a big political yeah. drive in the United States to um, minimize our cost because we we provide about a quarter of the UN budget yeah, yeah. just by ourselves. Although they always have to come after us for us. You know? Yeah, and, <laughs> Never and, and we are hugely in arrears yeah, on our people. Yeah, we are, exactly. Um, as to the absence of the UN ambassador, I would like to think it's because Ambassador Thomas Greenfield was tied up yeah. with things yeah. like Ukraine and yeah. Ethiopia. Very likely. Yes. Um, because I've known her for 30 years. Yes. You know, she's a personal friend. Oh, she is wonderful, by the she way. She is too. a yeah. wonderful, I wonderful her, yeah. person. Exactly. I first met her when we were both doing refugee affairs. Oh. And I know how deeply she cares about women and, yeah. and issues for women. I might take this on next year and see if I can. So, yeah. To that extent, there's, there's, mm -hmm. when, when you're the U.S. permanent representative to the U.N., there are a gazillion time pressures on you. And this one just may not have made it yes, to the top. Good point. Yeah, but good point. that said, in general, the U.S. does not put a whole lot of stock in U.N. conferences. No, that's right. And, and particularly on issues like status of women, because we don't accept the premise that yeah. international organizations can set yeah. U.S. government policy. Yeah. And we make a lot of enemies at the UN because we of do. That. We do. That's that was sort of what I was observing. You were you were more um, specific about it, but that is what I've observed I, I'm too. I retired from the federal government now, so I can say it. <laughs> when I was an employee, you never would have heard, would have heard this come from my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> because I, I I took an oath to always publicly support U.S. policy. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, well, well, I appreciate those comments, and actually. That's both one of the advantages and disadvantages of the Commission on the Status of Women is that they allow this full participation yeah. because it allows voices to be heard that otherwise would not probably be part of the conversation. And as far as I could tell, they were viewed equally. I mean, I don't, I didn't see that the best rooms got assigned to, you know, some, I mean, I, I got the sense that people were treated as though we are all players here. That's a huge advantage for this commission. Oh, it's a big advantage because, I mean, and we also therefore get a lot of the power of public opinion too, because we, we represent, I mean, there's press there. I mean, there, and I mean, there's a lot of, although I have to say, I was surprised how little coverage there was in the newspapers here. I think there was something in the New York Times when it started about the, but, but it wasn't like considered breaking news when we 
did something that I would think might have been pretty significant. Uh, so, but anyway, I, it is one of the advantages I think as you you put out is that it it allows for participation. One of the disadvantages is they aren't beholden to go back to, I mean, they don't have a responsibility to go back to a home country and say, this is now what we have agreed in Ecuador to do. Mm -hmm. um, they, because, uh, well, they may, they may do that, but this would not hold the same authority that the other UN countries might right. for that. But again, as I mentioned with Taiwan, um, that was, um, uh, you know, they would not have had any voice here at all mm -hmm. had there not been a voice that they had through these other. Yeah, and I think is it Iran that was kicked out of the uh, discussion anyway. So countries also have been for any reason excluded because of their really awful policies, which happened, and I think it's Iran that I'm talking about, I hope so, um, that they also, at this particular place, could have a voice. They couldn't have that official voice of being a member state, but they could have a voice with their organizations, many of whom, by the way, would not agree with the government's position. Mm -hmm. That's one of the important things we get here is that a lot of these people, um, uh, well, the Afghan, the Afghanistan group, for example, I would say there's not much of all the people who were there to present were people who were not in the country. They wouldn't have been allowed to leave the country to come and have that conversation with us uh, otherwise. So uh, it's it's issues like, it, it's only with, that's where the issues like the Commission on the Status of Women. I wanted to go back, unless there are other comments before we move forward, I wanted to go back and say how the agenda is set. Okay. Okay, because I see a couple of people. I was going to say, I know that Nancy, you are. I know you have a lot of experience. Unmute yourself and come on. <laughs> okay, I think she has only she can unmute. I think no, she. Has, I wasn't, she, am she, I unmuted? There she, yeah, there she. There she. I, I'm just uh, curious as to what other organizations were there from the U.S. Um, I wish I. Um, I wish I. I wish I could tell you, I wish I could tell you specifically. I can get you a list. I can get you a list. But the ones but I'm, the aware, ones of, I'm aware of, uh, a number of church-oriented church groups. I think the Presbyterian Church probably, probably have someone there. And then women's advocacy organization. Like AEW. Aunt Nancy, why don't you say what else you want to say and then unmute because we're having trouble. Okay. okay. Now is it okay? Okay. Um, uh, so the organization, then there are some organizations that are made up of, for example, the one I went to is a lot of religious groups all met together. That was the one that was uh, that the other um, the other Susan Lee was ahead of. Uh, anyway, so the religious groups or they may be women's advocacy groups, even in sports. Um, uh, but certainly also in uh, representation of governments. Um, there are people who are advocating for more women on uh, corporate boards and some of those things. And again, those people are going to be in the room. So many of them are coming with a specific interest. Like, I want to see more women in elected positions at the national government level, okay? So they would, if there are groups that are working for that, they're going to be at the table and talk about why that is important. And they will probably go to countries which have such regulations and say, is it working? Is it not working? Remember, we're gathering data all the time on this. So the other US ones often have a have an agenda that's something specific. But I do, I'm sure I have a list someplace of that, Nancy, and I'd be glad to look it up. I just did what I did just by interacting with the people I interacted with. And oh, and their universities are, are very big on having people here, normally not representing the university, but represented some facet of, of uh, uh, the work, but their, their identification would be that they were from you know, Vanderbilt University or something, and they were an expert on food policies in less developed countries or something. And then, so we have a number, the point is, it's a conglomerate, and so it's not nearly as focused as what you were describing, Steve. It's focused only in the sense that we're going to look at issues which are impacting women throughout the world, and that these varied groups believe can be changed with either uh, legal issues or with moral or uh, perhaps PR approaches. But one thing I wanted to do, oh, yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, 
what do the various organizations do during the year then? What kind of projects do they do to promote uh, the agendas that were set at the annual meetings? Yeah. You know, so how do you evaluate whether anything was accomplished okay. over the uh, past year? Okay. Make sure she mutes her, mutes her phone. Okay, now mute person. Cheryl. Okay. And Cheryl, thank you for asking that question because it's a really important question. Uh, this isn't just a two week conference and then nothing happens and then there's another two week conference the next year. This is a, a one, this is a 365 day a year process. So what we do is we set in place at these meetings things that are going to happen. And then I think, I don't know if you were here when I said that then the first thing we do at the next meeting is say, okay, what did we accomplish from that? So there is an accountability built in and you have to report back on what happened. So yes, the answer is that, that, um, that when we talk about an issue or work on an issue or make an issue a priority, then what that does is it says, oh, that sets an agenda for okay. us for a year. And we work on that and then we report on the next year and say, well, things got much worse because of this happened or we were able to put this in place or we were able to make an investment of $5 million and get this project done. Or So yes, the, no, Cheryl, it's not just a two week a year thing. That would be frustrating. And for, I told you about the little old ladies in tennis shoes. I mean, there are people, volunteers who make this a full-time job. I make women's issues pretty much a full-time job, but not this particular responsibility. But there are many people who do, but more also, remember these organizations have employees that are often represented. And so they are taking these, and then the countries are taking these, and these people are actually paid to uh, carry out these goals. As for example, the program that I went to in Armenia, the government chose to put a lot of money into training for women in rural areas. And so that was something they did based on what was said last year and then they reported this year. So that's, thank you for the question, Cheryl, because it's important. Um, the other thing I, I guess I wanna say is how do we decide, how does the commission decide? I don't decide. How does the commission decide um, what they're gonna work on? Well, what it, I told you that everything changed with Beijing, but one of the big things that changed with Beijing is they came up with a, a, um, an agenda of all the things they wanted to work on. And it was a very ambitious agenda, much broader than anything the Commission on the Status of Women had done before. And, they, uh, and, and with that, they even were very specific on some of the goals that they wanted to see within that. And so every year now, uh, it's the it's CSW is the, the commissioner says, but it, the reset came in 1995. So everything started in 1995 again, even though the, the, the commission is much older than that. That's when everything started. And I have a little list here. I can just, I won't read the whole thing, but just here's the kind of things that they did. Uh, they worried about the burden of poverty on women. So then they have, and I'm going to tell you that these are hundreds of pages of documents. I just picked the high point, but they, they actually didn't just say we're worried about poverty of women. They said, we want to know what specifically we can do. So they would say, what, what are the goals? Or um, access to health care and related services. So another big priority is going to be, how do we get women to get access to health care? And so they did this violence against women. Um, the effects of armed and other kinds of conflict on women, including those living under foreign occupation. Inequality in economic structures and policies in all forms of productive activities and access to resources. Inability, inequality, I'm sorry, between men and women in the sharing of power and decision making at all levels. So you see, I could go on, well, I will go on, I'll tell you. Um, insufficient mechanisms at all levels to promote the advancement of women. Um, lack of respect for an adequate promotion of protection of human rights for women, stereotyping of women, and inequality. Okay, so the point is each year the commission will pick something that came out of Beijing. And every year there's a report back on not just what we did since last year, but how well also have we carried out the Beijing initiative. So this goes way back to 95 and it says, how far have they come since 95 to achieve these goals? And as I think I mentioned, one of the challenges for people who care about these issues, as I do, 
is that in some countries, these issues are getting worse, not better. We are one of those countries, I think, right now with um, access to women for choice, their, their choices about their uh, uh, about their pregnancy. Uh, and one of their big things was people can't be forced to, forced to have an abortion. I thought that was an interesting thing. But the other side of that is women don't, you know, they should have the choice. Well, and family planning issues. Now, one thing I know that they always say is within the law when they do this, which is, I think that's a way of making sure they don't offend countries too much, you don't agree, is they say women should have all these rights within the law of their country. And I think that must have been a compromise that they tucked in at the end so that some people could approve it saying, well, we're a Catholic country, we wouldn't do that or we're or whatever. Um, but nonetheless, um, this that set the agenda for um, it, it sets the agenda every year, but it sets the agenda for the the time that um, uh, it's how they how they allocate the time for each program. And I will say that you can apply to to make a presentation. All of them aren't accepted, so I should also say that you have to go through a process. You can't. You, we couldn't just get let's say the one, two, three, four, five of us here and say we want to go and do a presentation next year on. Um, women in the Presbyterian church or whatever. Well, we could make a proposal on that. And then somebody would decide if that has enough value for other people. And they might say, well, that's really too narrow. Uh, if you want to talk about this, maybe you ought to talk about the role of religion in uh, the lives of, or in affecting the opportunities for women. And that might be another way to, to do that. So they, you can't just, I mean, you just don't, Come up with the topic and say i'm going to present on it you come up with the topic and i will tell you we have i mean even for the proposal we have paragraphs on what we're going to do and who is going to speak and everything because they have it's, it's all done at a really really high level and the uh, luckily the logistics are amazing they stream all the big meetings and uh, and the smaller meetings um they record so every so everything is documented that happens there as well. So anyway, that's how they come up with the topics each year. And let me just think whatever else I wanted. I had a couple other things I wanted to just um oh this is yeah this is the resolution it says this is the engages in general discussion of the gender equality identifying goals attained achievements made and efforts underway to close gaps and meet challenges. That's essentially what, what we're doing here. So we're saying, how are we doing in some issues? And and I, I wish that we could say that the UN had more, more abilities here. What I think it does have the abilities to do is to um, influence public policy, to use the power of, um, of uh, having world leaders say this is wrong. But I mean, I'm looking at, for example, we're trying to figure out how to deal with Putin and Putin is not going to respond to some of the traditional things that we would hope he would respond to, whether it's about women or whether it's about waging war against Ukraine. Um, and so what powers do we have? Well, some powers we may have are we may have powers of uh, of focusing or doing research to show what the results are. So we do have power to do things. I asked that question actually in the Afghanistan uh, uh, session I was in. I asked the question, I said, it's clear that the Taliban are not inclined to just do this because they're nice people or because a lot of people in the world think they should. Um, and um, and I said, what would what you say? They said, oh, well, they will respond to certain pressures, not those pressures. The question is, what pressures can we apply ethically and legally? Uh, and that's those are, are kind of big issues. Um, but what can we, what pressures can we apply? So would it be economic pressures? Obviously, we've tried that with things like, uh, like Russia. But can we do that with the Taliban? Can we freeze their assets in the U.S.? Can we, um, I mean, what, what, tools do we have in our tool bank? That we are able to, uh, we have enough um, people who are involved that we can explore those options. And sometimes they're powerful and sometimes they aren't. Um, you know, who said, I guess it was Steve who said something earlier that got me thinking. I remember when I was in college 
We celebrated the 25th anniversary. Would that have been right of the UN? When was the UN founded? 1946. Okay, so 46. That would have been the 50th, probably the 50th anniversary. Would that be right? Yeah. And we are big. All camp. I mean, it's a big deal. We had a, a, you know, the student union had a banquet. We had our international students. So we had all the 25th anniversary. 25th anniversary. Yeah, 25th. That would have been 25th. Let's see, yeah, 25th anniversary. In any case, it was a big deal then, is my point. I think we still had some some feeling that this was something that we were proud to be a part of. Um, I don't know if it's arrogance or if it's relevance or I don't know the reasons, but I would guess some of you around this, this screen probably would know better than I, but, um, but for whatever reason, it's not been the arbit arbiter of, um, of what's right and wrong for the world as much as we'd like. And a lot of the issues deal with, I mean, these terrible tragedies of, of um, people starving to death. I mean, there's, I mean, this, and there are places in the world we know that's happening, uh, or genocide, which is still happening in, um, in some countries. Um, these are issues that, and they certainly affect everybody, but they particularly affect women in the sense that women are the mothers who have the children who aren't getting fed. Uh, women don't have the economic opportunities always to find ways to make a living, particularly if they aren't allowed to become educated or to own a business. In many, many countries, still women are not allowed to, uh, to own businesses. They aren't allowed to uh, have economic means to support themselves, which is a way of keeping women, of course, unable then to, to speak for themselves. So I think I've said I have pages and pages of notes here so I can talk much more with anyone who wants to, but I would just like to suggest that uh, this is something that we, as a congregation, might want to look more at. And I would be glad to try to find folks, if you're interested, who could talk to us about, well, UNICEF is one that comes to mind, because I think most of us at least know what it is, but some of the other programs that we, uh, we need, and even how our Presbyterian Church, Presbyterian USA, uh, works with the UN in terms of its priorities for where we go in, because we, of course, as a church, have um, funds and people set aside to deal with problems in the world. And I know that one way I like to make contributions when there is a crisis in the world is through the church, because I always figure that we don't have a lot of money going to open because those people are already covered in other ways, so it will really go to where it's needed. But my question is, then, do we work with the UN to say, is Somalia a bigger issue than Ethiopia? Is I mean, where is the where is the greatest need? With that, I'm I have been I'm asked. Is this about the right time? I'm going to actually close my session right now. But I would be delighted to talk with anyone who wants to talk more about this. Um, I feel very privileged to have some of the opportunities that I have just to to have conversations. And I love. Uh, I always say that Bradley Hills is my is my. Um, my spiritual home, and this is where I like to share stories with my spiritual friends, and I'm delighted to have done that. But now I know that Carol wants to screen, and should I pass this over to you? Okay, I'm going to pass this over to Carol Starr. Pat, I, we can't thank you oh. enough. Oh, for, thank you so much. Oh, thank you for for such a stimulating program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, really. Thank you. This was supposed to have been the work, one of the first presentations we had when I became chair. Yeah, and then they met, no, that's right. And <laughs> the last one we had. For those of you who don't know, um, this is my last uh, uh, time uh, as the public face of the adult education lay ministry. Um, I have enjoyed the past three, four years immensely. I hope that this really hardworking and delightful group to work with has been of value to you uh, through the pandemic because we have we have really worked together and 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 tried to sort of redefine our mission and we will be back in well, September. And we, yes, and, and we welcome any ideas over that time period, but there is no way at this point in time um, that um, we can thank you enough. So, uh, I think today's program was an indication of the myriad ways that you have served us. When we first started, when Steve first came on as liaison to the session, um, 
you know, we were meeting in the lounge and we had it. And Diane Whitaker was chaired. They had very interesting programs. And then suddenly there was a pandemic and things went dark. Mm -hmm. And we weren't sure what our mission, our focus was going to be. But there was this guy, Steve Fox, <laughs> this who guy. found out about Zoom. David came to me and said, you guys think you could, could run a dog egg on Zoom? And I said, what's Zoom? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Not only did Steve learn Zoom, and he did have a team. We met Yoshi and, and Liz, he had folks that really helped with the technology. But Steve not only mastered Zoom, but he was able to attract speakers to Zoom, train the speakers on Zoom, which is continued to be uh, a challenge. Um, then as we transition, well, and we, we became a focus, really. I mean, the, the outreach, we had 80, 100 people on during the shutdown with international speakers from one time we had a speaker from pakistan as i recall across the nation and the world and you really were an inspiration and for us steve throughout some very very dark times and then continue to be uh as we transition back into somewhat of a normalcy by uh, Steve put together this program of the intersection of, of faith and and um, intersection of faith and hope and hope mm -hmm. with folks from our congregation to uncover the talents and the and the contributions of folks in the country uh, in the the congregation. Uh, you're give and take, and not only that, I mean, you are the master of ceremony par excellence. Uh, I feel like I get a much better program than if I were at home watching Meet the Press or Face the Nation. We can't begin, can't begin to thank you enough. Um, start. <laughs> we try to depict your, um, you, as the master <laughs> having everything to control her not so special this week Carol Carol painted down <laughs> Realize that there were many moments in this was your and camera. You you can see Steve as he was flexible. was rude to a guest, but there were many times. When we all were wondering how's he going to bring this back, and you always did, Steve. You really, really well, did. After this point, then after that, and in control. Um, we have this is the lay ministry found that has found you such a, an inspiration. We know that you like to read. Uh, some with my resources. With stimulating reading. The book I'm going to buy. The first book I'm going to buy is from the publisher of the book that we used on Advent and the book that we used on wow. Mount. They have one on the Sermon on the Mount. Yes. We have had doubling along a series on the Sermon on the Mount that Carol has has designed that we've never found a slot for. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Those of the group wants to get that in over the course yes. of the next year. I'm going to buy that. Yes. Thank you. Please, Michael. Oh, oh, Michael oh. Um, we have to. Uh, yeah. Michael will uh, get one last. Yeah, Dave, this is just a, a, a very small token of, of our appreciation. But I, I happen to have uh, some wine from Lichen, which is at the very base of the. 
of the Anderson Valley in Mendocino County. Ooh. And um, if you go north, you'll go all the way up to Rotary where they have the bubbly stuff. But this is on the south end before you get to the Yorkville Highlands. Thank you. And this is a your uh, like it in Pinot Noir. I hope you enjoy it. I'll send you a link to the to the uh, this this is far too good for the purpose that I have found wine useful for <laughs> many times. <laughs> <laughs> this last four years, I need a drink. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I do want to, um, I can't, we can't thank you enough. And but to also thank you in the audience uh, for supporting us, for being with us. And we have quite a challenge ahead, but uh, Diane Whitaker and I will be continuing to provide leadership in, in addition to a, just a very strong our uh, ministry, but contact us over the summer with uh, suggestions. We we welcome that. I, I would emphasize that both Carol and Diane are former chairs of this lay ministry, so that they they know better than I do. They've got much more institutional memory than I do. Uh, how this group can really serve the needs of the congregation and directions that we can go in. Now I'm not going away. Yay! <laughs> I'll, I'll still be here to throw spitballs at you. And Porky and I um, are, are in the early stages of working on a presentation on the history and symbolism of the sanctuary, which uh, both of us have a passion for the history of this church and the congregation. And that's one place where we feel like we can make a contribution. Well, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Thank you all. We will see you the Saturday after Labor Day. Same time, same Zoom room, I assume. Yes, and Bruce Douglas. With you know. Dr. Bruce Douglas. Oh, he's good. For the usual three weeks in September. We don't know the topic yet, but you know it's going to be good. <laughs> well, thank, so you thank you all. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, guys. Oh, what a wonderful court. That's amazing. What a beautiful. Yes. Yes.